Let us begin our all-too-brief glimpse at but a few of the known transitional fossils. We're going to be starting with the invertebrate to vertebrate transition. Pacaya is one of the earliest known fossils with a proto-notochord. Uninozoan is a hemichordate, showing quite a bit of increased complexity and development over Pacaya. Hycoella is an early chordate. While lacking bones and movable jaws, it does possess other characteristics of modern vertebrates, such as gills, a brain, notochord, heart, and a circulatory system. Conodonts were eel-like organisms with eyes and fins with fin rays. They're known largely by their teeth. In the picture below, you can see a sampling of the different teeth on the head of a pin. Here, we see two examples of primitive fish. Placoderms were not only one of the earliest jawed fishes, but they were also one of the earliest vertebrate predators. Acanthodians shared characteristics of both bony fish as well as cartilaginous fish. Hyrolepis is a bony fish which was the common ancestor to both modern ray-finned fish as well as lobe-finned fish. Osteolepis is an early lobed-finned fish already showing of amphibian-like skull and teeth. Eusthenoopteron possessed an amphibian-like skull, but more importantly, the bones and muscle attachments of its fins were becoming extremely similar to those found in tetrapod limbs. Pandorichthys was very tetrapod-like, possessing a flattened body, as well as foot-like fins. When we come to Acanthostega, we see that the fin-to-foot transition is almost complete. In Tiktaalik, we see that the fins now possess wrist and finger bones, which are adaptations for bearing weight. Additionally, Tiktaalik possesses a neck, as well as lungs and gills. In Ichthyostega, we see that the shoulder and pelvis have also become very tetrapod-like. Additionally, it possesses a robust rib cage extremely similar to that found in tetrapods. Pteroplax is representative of early land amphibians. The skull bone patterns remain similar to Ichthyostega, and the remnants of gills can be found at the neck. Proterogyrenus possessed an amphibian-like skull, but the limbs and spine were beginning to take on reptilian characteristics. In Solenodonsaurus, we see the loss of the lateral line on the head. Lanamus and Paleothyrus are both small, lizard-like organisms, which retained an amphibian-like skull. Pelicosaurs were primitive synapsids with differentiated teeth and a hard palate. Therapsids were mammal-like reptiles possessing complex jaws and teeth. Their legs were vertically attached under their bodies, as opposed to laterally at their sides. In the proto-mammals, we see further development of mammalian skull characteristics. At last we arrive at early placentals. They were small and rodent-like organisms. So what about marsupials and monotremes? They diverged previously to the advent of placentals. In the case of marsupials, there exists a fairly strong fossil record. In the case of monotremes, we know them mostly from their jaws. Returning to placentals, early primates are known largely by their skull fragments and jaws. In this case, they still did not look much like modern primates, except that their teeth began to take on primate-like characters. We know the ancestors to Old World primates largely by their jaws and skull fragments, both of which lead to the conclusion that brain size was increasing, while the length of its nose was decreasing. Propylopithecus is an early ape known by its jaw. Its teeth became a defining characteristic for apes. Egyptopithecus is an anthropoid ape possessing a much larger and rounder brain. Proconsul possesses features of both apes and monkeys. This is also where we begin to observe sexual dimorphism. Kenyapithecus, a descendant of Proconsul, is an ancestor to great apes and humans. Australopithecus afarensis was a slender and ape-like organism. It was also bipedal. Australopithecus africanus was even more slender than afarensis and possessed a larger brain. Its teeth possess similar characteristics as those found in species of the genus Homo. At long last, we arrive at humans. Homo habilis straddles the Australopithecine Homo boundary. It possessed a larger brain, 
and is associated with the first primitive stone tools. However, it may represent two distinct species of Homo. Homo erectus had a much larger brain and a thick brow ridge. It is associated with much better stone tools, as well as the first use of fire. Archaic Homo sapiens possessed a brain size intermediate to H. erectus in modern humans. They also possessed a much less robust skeleton and teeth than their predecessors. Homo sapiens sapiens are modern humans. While our brain size has increased in comparison to archaic Homo sapiens, our skeletal and muscular system is less robust. Now, we know you're all asking, what about Neanderthals? Well, Homo neanderthalensis was a side lineage. They were very successful for a time, but they've gone extinct. Based on the current evidence, they did not contribute to the genome of modern humans.